Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing another episode of our Planet Zoom Mod Spotlights, where we take a look at the um, wonderful uh, mods people have been making, and have a look at the diversity of the world around us. Um, today, we've got a very interesting bunch of animals for part 50. I can't believe we've already made it to 50, and then I've got uh, another five more parts for this uh, saved up, so we're going to get really really stuck into planet zoo uh for the next couple of weeks it's going to be very awesome so we're going to be starting off today with the blue crane by bongo hardwood who we all know him he makes these the actually a zookeeper too so that's really awesome and he makes all these wonderful birds so if you can see this is the adult here so this is the blue crone crane which is also known as the stanley crane or the paradise crane and funny enough is actually the national bird of south africa and these guys are quite a tall crane, like a uh, tall ground dwelling bird, but they're small for crane standards, but still generally a pretty big bird. They can get to about 100 to 120 centimeters uh, tall, or 3 foot 3 to 3 foot 11, and have a wingspan of 180 to 200 centimeters, or 511 and 600, uh, uh, 6 foot 12, uh, not 6 foot 12, 6 foot 7 uh, inches. So they've got quite a big wingspan. And they weigh between 3.6 and 6.2 kilograms, or 7.9 to 13.7 pounds. And generally, it's have those kind of measurements. Very, quite big. Big bird, not the biggest stork, but, or crane, really cool. Um, you can see they're quite a interesting looking bird. They've got like a pale uh, gray across their body, with like a pink-ish uh, beak. And they also have the most distinctive features. You can see they have these long uh, wings. Uh, we can't really notice that here, but you can see these these very, very long uh, feathers here that come off. The wingtip feathers also uh, trail to the ground. And you see the primaries are black here, as you can see. And unlike most other cranes, they have a pretty large head proportionally. And they have a much thicker neck, so they're quite big and bulky for a crane. And the juveniles, as we can see over there, uh, are similar, but they're slightly lighter. And they don't have these long wing plumes. And they have this tawny coloration on their faces, so you can see it's a wonderful wing plume that they got here. So, for their habitat, they live in uh, dry grassy uplands or partial greens with plains with scattered trees. And they prefer areas that are in, in the nesting sea that have both access to upland and wetland areas. And they feed almost exclusively in dry, dry areas. And they are altitudinal migrants, so they will generally nest in the lower grasslands. Uh, from an elevation about uh, 1,300 to 2,000 meters and move down lower altitudes during the winter. So they will migrate up and down mountains and see uh, and do all that so they can get the best advantages of the season. So they have the most restricted distribution of all the uh, cranes and even species with uh, lower populations such as the Siberian or Whooping Cranes. Uh, are found in a much larger area than these guys. So these guys are pretty much only really found in South Africa and those southern countries. And they are partially social, at least during the dry uh, breeding season. But they have a strict hierarchy with the largest adult males being dominant. And then they will overlap in range with three other crane species. Uh, but the interaction known with these species is these guys are, uh, are not really known compared to those other large waders. Um, they're also uh, relentlessly aggressive uh, towards other animals when they're nesting which is quite consistent for cranes, then it can include, uh, even with uh, non-predatory species such as tortoises, clovers, sparrows, and cattle, they can get quite aggressive with them, which is very interesting. And humans will also be attacked if they approach the nest too closely, and the aggressive, ma and, uh, the aggressive male may have torn clothes or drawn blood in the, uh, drawn blood in so cases. So if you want to get scratched up and some bleeding, uh, go walk next to their nest. Uh, that's what they want. <laughs> so we'll have a look at the babies while we're talking about their reproduction. Really, really cool babies we've got going on here. So their breeding season is highly seasonal with eggs uh, recorded between October and March. And the pair forming will start in October and the both potential parents will run circles around each other and have a dance and, you know, make all lovey-dovey eyes to each other, as you know. And um, in a great majority of known nests, uh, after the uh, mating dances have commenced, about two week period, they lay two uh, eggs, really one or three, but both male and females will incubate. But the male often incubated at night uh, during the day, uh, defending the nest while the female incubates. So they'll take turns. And the incubation stage for these guys lasts about 30 days, 
and the young are able to walk after two days of being uh, hatching and can swim shortly thereafter, so they're born pretty precocial. And they're fed primarily by their mothers who regurgitate the food into their mouths. And the chicks fledge at about an age of three to five months, where the young will continue, um, at, uh, the young continue to be uh, needed uh, or tended to until the next uh, breeding season. And when at that time, they pretty much just get chased off by their parents. So a little bit about these guys in terms of their decline. As I mentioned, they are vulnerable. So they will pretty much common in parts of their range with an approximately 26,000 individuals. There's been a very, very sudden population crash and around the 1980s were considered vulnerable. And for the last two decades, they've largely disappeared from places such as Eastern Cape, Leslo and Swaziland. And the population in the North Free State, Limpopo, um, Gating, uh, Mumbalaba and the Northwest Province have greatly declined, about 90%, with much of other small populations uh, disappearing. The primary um, explanation for these declines has been human population growth, such as the com uh, conversion of grasslands to plantations or accidental um, baiting and stuff like that and hunting. And they've actually now decided that uh, the South African government's decided to step up and protect these species and is um, part of some agreements and also been assessed by the IOCN. Uh, so. And they also have some sort of cultural significance as well, as they were specifically important to uh, like the Zulu people and the Shahona people, where they used them as like, flags and they wore uh, their feathers as a headdress, a headdress, so they were very much uh, culturally important birds. And um, as today, they are considered the natural bird, uh, national bird of South Africa, so that's pretty cool. So again, that was done by Bongo Hardwood, came out really, really nicely, so we'll be moving on to the next animal. We have got next the uh, black, uh, not black footed wallaby, also the red necked wallaby, also known as the Burnett's wallaby. So these guys are a medium sized uh, macropod, so they are a rel relative of the kangaroos and they are a wallaby, so that's what we get that. And they're found mostly in the most temperate and fertile parts of eastern Australia, so that includes Tasmania as well. And while they are native to these parts of Australia, they've also been introduced to places such as New Zealand, the United Kingdom, uh, uh, Ireland, France, and Germany. So that's very weird to see wallabies in Germany. Um, you can tell these guys apart from their black noses and paws, and they have a stripe on the upper lip and a grizzled, like medium grey coat with a reddish wash across the shoulders, where they game redneck wallaby. Yeah, yeah. They can weigh about 13.8 kilograms uh, to uh, 18.6 kilograms and uh, all 30 to 41 pounds and reach a head to body length of about 90 centimeters or 35 inches although males are generally slightly larger than the females and they may live up to nine years and their distribution as i mentioned they found in coastal scrub forests and places like that in um, queensland to south australia and in tasmania and many of those uh bar straits islands and it's unclear where the uh, tasmanian ones have actually been introduced and um, sadly, the numbers have, well, not sadly, but luckily, across Tasmania and close to Queensland, the numbers have exploded because of a reduction of hunting pressure and the partial clearing of forest, which creates like a mosaic of pastures that these guys can enjoy. But for no apparent reason, they're not that common in uh, Victoria. So these guys are mainly social, like other uh, wallabies, uh, and they will gather together when they have abundant food resources, where they have a social hierarchy similar to other wallabies. Uh, and the recent study has also determined that these guys are able to manage conflict by reconciliation, which involves post-conflict uh, reunion after a fight of former opponents. So basically they fight and make up, and that's how they stay together, it's like how we all should. And they are mainly nocturnal, so they spend most of the time in their daylight resting. And in terms of their breeding, uh, the female uh, estrus lasts about 33 days, and during um, copulation, the female um, first licks the male's neck, and then the male will lick the cheek against the female, and then they will have a little brief fight, and then they will mate. And the couple will stay together for a day or two before separating, and then the female bears at least one offspring at a time. The young will stay in the pouch for about 280 days, whereas the females and the offspring stay together for only about a month. However, females may uh, stay within the home range of their mothers throughout their life, while males leave at the age of two. And as red-necked wallabies engage in um, alloparental care, that means one individual may adopt children of another. So they may become adoptive parents if necessary, um, which is really, really cute, I think. Good parents. And there's also a common behavior that's seen in uh, wolves, elephants, humans, and fathead minnows. 
And in terms of their diet, uh, they basically feed on anything that's green, because of grasses, weeds, roots, and uh, tree leaves. And as I mentioned, there's kind of two, uh, three subspecies. There's the redneck wallaby, the burnet's wallaby, which is the type uh, species or type subspecies, and the Tasmanian subspecies, which is kind of sometimes not considered. And as I mentioned, they've been uh, introduced to places across the world. One place has been New Zealand, especially around Canterbury. They've become a really, really big issue around there because of uh, them destroying the soils, because they often will um, destroy the banks and stuff like that. They've also been um, colonies in England, such as in um, Sussex and um, Scotland. And there's also a population living in the Isle of Man, which is very interesting, which is descended from a wildlife population on the island between the 1960s and 70s. And they estimate the population is about 83 individuals. And there's a few other isolated populations here and there, but um, still really, really wonderful animals. I think these guys are cool. And it was made by Seth. Uh, Seth making a good return uh, with these cute little wallabies. Came out really, really well. So now we're going to be moving on to our next mammal. We've got some capuchins. This one's a bit of a remaster. So this one is made by Leaf, everyone's favorite Leaf. So this is the tuft capuchin, also known as the brown capuchin, the black capped capuchin, or the pin monkey, which is a monkey from the New World, specifically South America and the Caribbean islands of Trinidad and um, Gata, I believe you pronounced that. And they're one of the most widespread primates in the neotropics. And um, they've often been rec uh, recommended considering uh, black stripe, black and golden um, capuchins as separate species in a new genus, which is these guys. And um, in terms of their diet, they are uh, omnivorous animals. They feed mainly on fruit and invertebrates, and sometimes uh, feed on smaller vertebrates such as lizards and bird chicks and other plant um, parts. They've also been found in many uh, all sorts of environments, such as tropical and subtropical forests, dry forests, and secondary forests. And like other capuchins, they're quite social. They form groups of about 8 to 15 that are led by a dominant male. So in terms of their size, they reach a head of body length to about 32 to 57 centimeters, or 13 to 22 inches, with a tail that's about 38 to 56, or 50 to 22 inches, and reach a weight of 1.9 to 4.8 kilograms, or 4.2 10.6 pounds, but the males are generally a little larger than the females. And these guys, like most other monkeys, they are diurnal, so they will hang out uh, during the day and often go looking for food and searching. And um, these guys live in groups, as I mentioned, are from 2 to 20 or more animals, and they usually, these groups will have one adult male, but mixed groups of multiple males can occur with one dominant male. And in terms of their breeding, I'll have a look at the babies, well, uh, I mentioned that. So look at these cute little babies. In terms of their breeding, they have a gestation period of about 180 days where one young is born and sometimes twins. The young, when they're born, they only weigh about 200 to 250 grams and they carry it on the backs of their mother. And when the, the mother will feed her child for about nine months, uh, but the young is sexually mature, uh, immature until its seventh year, which is quite late for a primate of its size, surprisingly. And these guys often are um, preyed upon by animals such as large birds of prey, and um, they even have these um, alarms that specifically tell you, oh no, a bird, which is very interesting. So as I mentioned, they have a pretty um, uh, varied diet. There's actually a population that's also been discovered that has uh, managed to learn how to use tools, like they use uh, rocks and stuff to break nuts. They're basically in the Stone Age now, so that's pretty, pretty dangerous. And um, besides eating on those nuts, they'll eat insects, fruit, larvae, eggs, young birds, frogs, lizards, bats, and rodents. And also be known to chase cats, so it's very interesting. And um, these guys, as I mentioned, they live across the tropical rainforests and all stuff like that. And in some places they are considered critically endangered, but most of the part they're considered least concerned, they're doing quite well. And these are the species that you see most often in movies, if you see Night at Museum. The little monkey there was a tough capuchin, and um, these are quite common in zoos as well. Tough capuchins are very, very uh, cool and interactive with monkeys, I think. And I think Leaf did a good job in remastering these ones. I think they did a really good job. Really, really cute monkeys. So now we're going to move on to uh, our next animal. We're moving on to some ungulates. So we're going to move on with the next one put on by Narwhaler. He has remade the Scimitarhorn Oryx. So these guys, also known as the uh, Sahara Oryx, or just the Scimitar Oryx. Uh, these guys are a species of Oryx that were once widespread across North Africa. 
And sadly, the conservation story uh, went downhill, but really have made a great recovery. The species was considered extinct in the wild in 2000, but a group was released into an acc acclimation enclosure by the um, Oke Remi Ordi Cham Faunal Reserve. I don't speak any Middle Eastern language, I apologize. In 2016, but were released back into the wild. And additionally, they are 21 animals were placed in this enclosure in 2017. And they are technically considered, um, well, they're still kind of considered extinct in the wild, but there are lots of big efforts to release them across the uh, wild areas. So it's very, very interesting. So uh, they have adapted well, luckily. So in 2021, 60 new calves are born. So the number of the wild is about 400 animals. And um, they have now been considered, not been assessed since 2016, uh, but the species was truly extinct in the wild, so it remains extinct in the wild, but technically, under those, it's technically not extinct in the wild anymore, it would just be critically endangered. So the scimitar horn aurochs uh, is quite big, um, the antelope stands a little bit more than a meter tall, or 3.3 feet at the shoulder, and a male can weigh between, is this the male? I think this is the male, yeah, this is the male. So a large male can weigh between 140 and 210 kilograms, or 310 to 460 pounds, and the females weigh between 91 and 140, or 201 to 309 pounds. And the coat you can see here is a very, very interesting coat. They've got like a light, uh, got a white and red brown chest with black markings on the forehead, presumably to help them with the uh, sun, so they don't get reflections in their own. And the uh, calves are actually, as we can see here, look at these cute little guys here. Well, that's not what we want to see. They're born with like a yellowish coat here uh, with distinguishing markings and then they will change into their adult colorations at about 3 to 12 months of age. It's very interesting. So, as I mentioned, uh, they form herds of about 70 members that are usually guided by, by the bulls and then they inhabit all these different semi-desert and desert areas and they're well adapted to living in the extreme heat with very, very um, effective cooling mechanisms in their body and also have a uh, very low requirement for water. So they're very good at saving water with all the adaptions that comes with, like the kidneys and such, which is very, very interesting. And they often feed on foliage, grasses, succulent plants and plants during, uh, plant plants, plant parts, I mean, during the nights and early mornings. And for their births and periods, their birth uh, typically peaks between March and October. And after a gestation period of about eight to nine months, similar to a human, one calf is born, and soon after, the female can have a postpartum estrus, so she can get back ready to go. So the scimitar horn aurochs was quite widespread across northern Africa, and its decline has been a result of climate change during the Neogene period, which caused the decline. But then after lots of trophy hunting, especially for their horns, by native peoples and traders and stuff like that, it pretty much reduced them to near extinction, well, to extinction in the wild. But luckily, they have been bred in special reserves in places like um, Sengal and Moroboko, and even some other private animal ranches, uh, exotic animal ranches in Texas and America. So they've created a very, very big and stable population in captivity with this project that I just mentioned at the beginning, uh, releasing a small herd into Chad. So they're technically not distinct in the wild anymore, but they haven't been assessed, so they still technically are. But they were also domesticated by ancient Egyptians, and they're thought to be used as food and sacrifices uh, and offerings to the gods. And um, wealthy people in ancient Rome also bred them, and they've been used as valuable hides since the Middle Ages. And the unicorn myth may have also originated from these guys, since they kind of look like they have one horn from the side. But yeah, in terms of their conservation, they're a very, very great conservation story at work, showing how captive breeding and... Uh, lots of heavy management can really help species come back and now there's believed to be a population of like a 400 in the wild so they would be technically considered uh, critically endangered at least so they're doing uh, come back from extinct to the wild really really awesome we'll have a look at the female and I think Nawala did a really good job at uh, bringing this back up came out really nice so yeah now we're gonna move on to another one so this next one was done by leaf and monsoon we have got the solar the wonderful solar there we are so i've mentioned this guy a couple guys before also known as the um, asian unicorn or the spindle horn is one of the world's large, la uh, rarest large mammals and um, is native to the anamite ranges of laos and vietnam and was described in 1993 so that's very 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 uh not long very 
what's the word? Um, not like that long ago. So this was a large animal. This guy can get quite large. Um, been undocumented for such a large time, a uh, long amount of time. It's very, very interesting. So um, it's also very, very hard to find. They've been kept in captivity for uh, short periods of time over weeks and months. And um, the last photo, I think, of one was 2013. They're a very, very uh, secretive species. They do a really good job at hiding from people. So uh, the description is that they, uh, the height of the female is about 84 centimeters at the shoulder, with males being a little bit um, larger, of course. Their head to body length is about 150 uh, centimeters or 4.9 feet. And they're generally shown to have like these kind of interesting characteristics. And their hair on the back, you can see, is like uh, two and a half centimeters, all that. And they have it soft, thin features, all like that. And the tail measures about 23 centimeters or 9.8 inches. And you can see both of the sexes appear to have these long spindle hordes. And they get the name the Asian Unicorn because they have kind of believed it since they're so rare. And if you look at them like on the side there, it kind of looks like one horn. So they're really, really interesting there. So as I mentioned, they kind of inhabit these uh, evergreen and deciduous forests that is found across uh, Southeast Asia, at at least the eastern parts. And sightings have been reported from steep river valleys from 3,000 to 1,800 meters, uh, 300 to 1,800 meters above sea level. And in Vietnam, the Laos, the kind of range is approximately about 5,000 kilometers. That includes four nature reserves, uh, so that's good. And during the winter, they tend to migrate down to the lowlands. So there's been lots of reports of local peoples to see what they eat, um, also captive females seeing what they eat, and they seem to um, have grouping patterns that's similar to animals like bushbucks, uh, anola, and um, shitunga. So they are quite similar to other forest-dwelling bovids, not too different. And um, they have a diet of also things like uh, all sorts of spindle, uh, spleenwort, and all sorts of other mid-level browsing plants. And there's very much little known about their reproduction, as we'll talk about the little baby here, who's very, very cute. Um, they seem to likely have a fixed mating season from late August to mid-October, uh, mid-November, I mean, with only single calves being documented, mainly during uh, summers of mid-April and June. And in absence of most of the specific data, it's assumed that their gestation's about 33 weeks. Um, and three reports of sailors killing on nearby villages include young uh, accompanying mothers, where they had short horns, uh, shows that they were during horns they suggested the birth extended a period of at least two or three months So it's believed that they kind of grew qu their horns quite fast They're quite cute little guys, aren't they? But um the conservation is very difficult because they are critically endangered because their habitat is very restricted and It's very likely to be endangered through things like habitat loss and habitat fragmentation And they also suffer from hunky, uh local hunting because of uh, illegal trades such as furs Traditional medicines and the bush meat that can be a very big issue for them. And they're often caught in snares that have been meant to caught, catch animals such as wild boar, uh, sambar, and mojax. And more than 26,000 snares have been removed from salar habitats by conservation groups. So being so rare and, uh, and also poor, it's very f not often sighted. And also being um, in a habitat like that is also is the reason that they've considered to be um, critically endangered. So hopefully we can learn a lot more about these guys and can help protect them. I really like the solar. This was done by Leaf and Monsoon, everyone's favorite uh, two modders. Uh, I love Monsoon. I remember him from the old Zoo Tycoon days. Really, really awesome. So next we're going to go on to another mod by Narwhaler. And this one's another remake, I think. Like these guys, we have got the Red Deer. So really, really awesome Red Deer here. And I believe this is supposed to be a Barbie Red Deer the skin here. So these guys are one of the largest species of uh, deer. Um, the males, you can see the stag here, and the hinds are the one behind them with the uh, foal. And they live mostly in Europe, th across the Caucasian mountains, Iran, and parts of Western Asia. And they've also inhab used to inhabit the, uh, inhabit the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. Uh, that's where the Barbary deer lived. And they are the only species of deer to live in Africa. But because people like hunting them, they've been introduced all across the world, such as places like Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Canada, Peru, Uruguay, Chile, and Argentina. And they are hunted for venison and their uh, velvet and all that. So quite uh, common. So as I mentioned, they're the fourth largest species of deer um, behind the moose, elk, and sambar deer. And they're a ruminant. 
So they will have an even number of toads as you can see here, like camels, goats and giraffes. And uh, these guys have a relatively long tail compared to the Asian North American relatives. And some subspecies have different variations, the smallest being the Croatian red deer and the largest being the Caspian red deer. And uh, the largest deer found was in the Carpathian Mountains in Central Europe. And Western European red deer, which has historically grown quite large, are descendants from indigenous populations living in New Zealand, Argentina, which grow quite large. So the animals that live in New Zealand and uh, Argentina today are descended from the Caspian red deer. So that's why they're quite large. And if we spend all this time talking about their size, we should mention how big they are. So a male red deer can get between 175 and 250 centimeters, or 69 to 98 inches long, and from the base of the tail to the nose, and they typically weigh between 160 and 240 kilograms, or 350 to 530 pounds, and the female is a little bit smaller, 160 to 210 centimeters, or 68 to 83 inches long, and weigh between 120 and 170 kilograms. Or 260 to 370 pounds and um as i mentioned their size will vary a lot between the subspecies and the largest subspecies as we mentioned the carpathian red deer can get up to like uh, 500 kilograms and the smallest is uh the croatian red deer that gets up to 100 kilograms so very interesting and they get quite large antlers you can see in the spring they obviously regrow them they lose them every year and uh, they typically measure between uh, 71 centimeters to in total and weigh about a kilogram. Uh, but the large ones can get 115 centimeters and weigh up to uh, 5 kilograms or 11 pounds. That's very, very interesting. And obviously, they will use these to fight each other and determine who's the biggest and strongest male and who gets the pass on their genes. So as we talk about that, they'll often go off and do that and fight each other and do the rut. And then what also happens, oh, you get a teaser of that, you can hear them. So the female red deer, as we'll talk about her, they get sexually mature at about two years of age. And as they breed and the males collect their little herds of hinds, um, they will um, obviously impregnate her. And then the gestation period after that is about 240 to 262 days. And the offspring when born is about 115 kilograms. Or 35 pounds and after two weeks the calves are joined the herd and they're fully weaned at about two months of age the offspring will remain with their mother for almost one full year uh leaving about the time the next spring offspring next season's offsprings reproduce uh are produced and they have the gestation period is same for all these subspecies and as you can see if we look at the little babies here and how cute they are all these little babies are spotted so this is common as with many species of deer but they will lose these spots at the end of the summer and however, some and many species of old will do, they will retain these spots in the summer coats. And in captivity, they can live over 20 years, but in the wild, it's up to 10 to 13. With some subspecies with list predation, up to 15 years. So yeah, very interesting bunch of animals. And Rawala did a great job remaking them. Uh, the original one was on the reindeer, but these guys are on the fallow deer, and I think it fits them much better. And plus all the texture updates, I think it came out much, much better than that. Um, the other one so now we're going back to leaf and monsoon um uh, no, not leaf and monsoon frazzle 64 and monsoon uh they both uh, collaborated for this one we have got the asian golden cat so really really wonderful guys here these guys are a medium-sized wild cat it's from the northeastern indian subcontinent uh, southeast asia and china and they're considered near threatened since 2008 because of uh, poaching and habitat destruction since the Southeast Asian forests undergoing the world's fastest regional deforestation. So these guys are a medium sized cat as you can see here, they're not particularly huge. They have a head to body length of about 66 to 105 centimeters or 26 to 41 inches with a 40 to 57 centimeter um, long tail or 16 to 22 inches and is 56 centimeters or 22 inches tall at the shoulder and they weigh between 9 and 16 kilograms, which is two to three times that of a domestic cat. And you can see they're also polymorphic, so they have all sorts of different morphs. Uh, this is the most common morph you get, uh, the golden kind of one, and then you can get reddish brown. Buff brown have been recorded in northeast India and Bhutan. Uh, reddish brown morphs have been Sumatra and melanistic individuals that are all black have been found in the eastern Himalayas. And also there's a spotted um, Asian golden cat with large rosettes on its shoulder was actually described from China in 1872 and the morpher was recorded in China, Bhutan and uh, very interesting. Uh, 
So these guys have a quite large range. They can be found from eastern Nepal, northeastern India, Bhutan, and to Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, southern China, Malaysia, and Sumatra. And they prefer habitats interspread with rocky areas and dry deciduous forests and subtropical and tropical forests. So they're pretty generalist in that regard. And um, in terms of their behavior, like most cats, they're solitary and territorial. They will use their pee to mark territories, and these territories can be between 47.7 kilometers and increase more than 50 percent during the raining season while females are slightly smaller about 32 and they will overlap with the males and uh, Asian golden cats are very good at climbing trees and will uh, when necessary and they typically hunt animals such as we'll have a look at this one over here that's the baby we'll have a look at the baby after so in terms of their prey they typically hunt birds hares rodents reptiles small ungulates uh, like Munjax and um, Sambar deer. And they're actually very capable of bringing down larger animals than themselves, such as water buffalo calves. And in the mountains of Sikkim, they actually play on um, Goral, apparently. So that's very interesting. But um, they actually um, kill prey with the nape bite, sure, like most of the cats. They also pluck birds larger than pinions before uh, beginning to feed and they, like other cats, they will hiss and meow and purr and growl. So not very different in terms of that, in terms of the communication. Very similar to your domestic cat actually. And there's not much known about the reproductive behavior because they're quite rare in the wild. But look at this cute little uh, kitten, very, very cute. So uh, female Asian golden cats will sexually mature between 18 and 24 months. Or males are begin to mature at 24 months. Uh, females will come into estrus every 39 days, and the male will seize the sk uh, skin of the neck and the female with teeth, and obviously impregnate her. After the adjacent period of 78 to 80 days, the female gives birth into a sheltered place of a litter of one, two, three cubs. The cubs weigh about 220-250 grams, but triple their size over the first eight weeks of life. They're actually born already possessing their adult coat and open their eyes at about 6 to 12 days old, and in captivity they can live up to 20 years. So we'll talk about this one while we're on the way, while we're moonwalking. So in terms of their threats, as I mentioned, they've very really suffered from deforestation, but they've also been uh, killed in revenge for hunting on their people's poultry, and are threatened by poaching and the illegal wildlife trade. So that can be very, very dangerous, uh, mainly for their fur. And in Myanmar, 111 body parts of at least 120, 110 individuals were found in four markets between uh, 1991 and 2006. And they are significantly greater than those of non-threatened species, and especially people like the ones with the rosettes. So that could be forcing the rosetted golden cats out of the population. And luckily they are considered uh, um, CITES Appendix 1, so they're fully protected over most of their range. Um, and they're only really protected only within the borders of protected areas in Bhutan, which no one hunts in Bhutan, so they don't really need it. <laughs> and um, there are populations of captivity, about 20 across eight European zoos and the European Endangered Species Program. But yeah, so they have a representative cat to population and are doing okay in the wild. We just need to make sure they don't decline too much further. So yeah, very, very wonderful uh, mod there by Frazzle64, not Leaf, I apologize, and Monsoon. And now we're having a look at Narwhaler again. Uh, we have got uh, another seal he made. He has made the Mediterranean monk seal. So look at these wonderful guys here. It really came out well. So these guys are a monk seal that are um, very, very endangered. The estimated population is of less than 700 individuals uh, that survive in three to four isolated subpopulations within the Mediterranean and the Anglo Sea, um, Maldera, and the Cap Capo Blanco. Uh, areas of the northeastern Atlantic Ocean and it's believed to be the world's rarest pinniped. So this species of seal grows uh, from approximately 80 centimeters at birth or 2 foot 2.6 feet and they get to an average length as an adult of 2.4 meters or 7 feet 9 in. and with females being slightly shorter than males of course. Males on average weigh between uh, 100, weigh about 320 kilograms, with females weighing a little less at 300, so it's between 710 and 660 pounds, and they overall range between that 240 to 400 um, range, so they can get quite big at 400 kilograms. And though they can live up to 45 years, the average lifespan is thought to be about 20 to 25, and reproduction maturity is believed to be about age 4. So, um... The monk seal's pups are about 1 meter long and weigh about 15 to 18 kilograms of born, and they have, as we can see here, 
You can see their little uh, little grubby faces look very, very cute. They have this really cute little face. Mm -hmm. And um, they are believed actually to have the shortest hair of any pinniped, and their fur is kind of black and brown to dark gray in females with a pale belly. And they uh, have very, very pronounced long nostrils that face upwards. This is very different from their Hawaiian relatives. And um, their flippers are also relatively short with slender claws and have two pairs of retractable abdominal teats unlike other uh, pinnipeds. That's very interesting. So very little is known about these seals. As a population, there's estimated to be about 500 pairs of them around the world, or around where they live. And they've been suggested that they are polygamous, so that means males can be very, very territorial, and they will defend their females and have like beach masters and all that. Uh, there's no breeding uh, season uh, since births take place all year round, but they peak in October, September, October, November. And although mating will take place in the water, females give birth and take care of their pups and beaches or underwater caves. The use of these underwater caves may also uh, help because it makes predation almost impossible as the pups are difficult to access. And um, data analysis indicates that only 29% of pups born between September and January survive, sadly. Uh, which also um, believed to be because of the high surf around these areas in time of breeding, but just because it's a really tough time to read with the high tides and uh, all that. But luckily they are making a sort of recovery. Uh, they are diurnal, um, so they will hunt during the day. And they feed on a variety of fish, mollusks, and primarily octopus, octopus squids, and eels. See these ones swimming around here. There they are. So, they'll eat all sorts of that. Although they commonly feed in sh shallow coastal water, they've been known to forage in water of up to 250 meters deep with an average death of bearing ring between specimens, and they prefer to hunt in wide open areas, allowing them to use their speed more effectively. And also, they are successful bottom feeding hunters, and they've even observed lifting slabs of rock in search of prey, so that's pretty cool. And the habitat has changed a lot over the years because of um, hunting and all that. And scientists believe that they have a recent adaptation um, trying to breed as infrequently as possible because of increases of human population and stuff, and increased disturbance. It's because they're naturally shy nature and sensitive to human disturbance, they've been slowly adapted to try and avoid conflict with humans within the last century, and perhaps even earlier. And the coastal caves, however, are a danger to newborns, uh, and uh, the major mortality of pups is sea storms when they set the caves. Uh, and as I mentioned, they kind of found all across the Mediterranean. Uh, they can be found in the Black Sea, Northwestern Atlantic, Africa, the Mediterranean as well. And they'll be found in places such as the Canary Islands and the Azores, so this place. Vagrants have actually been seen as from Cape Verde and Gambia, so that's very interesting. And a lot of the things that really have hurt their population is commercial hunting during the 20th century, uh, eradication by fishermen, where they were considered a pest, and um, also uh, coastal urbanization and pollution. But luckily there have been some efforts, but the population today is estimated to be less than 700 individuals who are scattered across the place. And the largest population is kind of in Greece, in the Oregon Sea, with about 300 animals. Some are 100 in Turkey, and some subpopulations around these areas, and the, also the Canary Islands. And, um, but luckily they are considered recovery, there's more and more sightings happening all the time. And there have been lots of conservation efforts, they are protected and all that. And some of the populations even considered critically endangered, so they are considered protected in most of the areas they live in. And luckily, um, there's some good effort going into them. So really, really awesome that we get to see more of these guys. And hopefully they wish them a good recovery. So that was done by Noah Waller. And our last animal today is an animal I'd never really thought we'd see as an exhibit species, but it came out really, really well. So we have got, by leaf, the black-throated three-toed sloth. So really, really wonderful guy here. Is this a baby? Yes, it's a baby. You want to talk to the adults? Look at this wonderful guy here. So this is the brown uh, throated sloth, which is a species of three-toed sloth that can be found in Central and South America. And it's one of the most common and is found in those forests, as I mentioned. So the brown to uh, throated sloth is similar in size and built to most other three-toed uh, three species with both males and females being between 42 and 80 centimeters, or 70 to 31 inches, in total body length, with a relatively short tail between only 2.5 and 9 centimeters, with adults weighing between 2.25 2 and 6.3 kilograms, or 5 to 13 pounds, with no really significant size difference. And they have pretty large claws too, so each of these three claws can get between 7 to 8 centimeters uh, long on the fourth leg, and 5 to 5.5 on the hind leg. 
So that you can see they've also got this quite blunt nose and inconspicuous ears. And a sloth, uh, they also have no incisors or canine teeth, and their cheek teeth are like simple and pig-like. They also have no gallbladder, uh, cecum, and appendix. That's also very interesting. And you can see they have this very, very um, grayish fur that you can see here. Is that one an albino? Or is it just weird shadows? But you can see here that they've got this like, grayish, grayish fur. Yeah, that's a shadow. Let's have a look over here. They've got this grayish fur uh, that covers their guard heads, and also um, they have a much softer layer of uh, dense underfur as well. And these hairs are actually very interesting because they actually create habitat for sloth moths and um, communal species of algae, where the moths will kind of hang out and feed on the algae on these guys. And it, in reward, it helps with camouflage for the um, sloths, so they're able to better hide from predators, since they're very much not able to run around and hide from predators. They often have this rich fungal flora, and actually certain strains of fungi they grow on the sloths seem to possess um, anti-parasitic, anti-cancer, and antibacterial qualities, so it's very, very interesting. And I just think it's really awesome. So as I mentioned, they're pretty much found widespread. They're found from Honduras down to eastern Peru, and everywhere in between, very, very common. And they're found in many types of environments, as long as they're trees. And they can typically found between sea level and 1,200 meters, or 3,900 feet. Although there's been some individuals that have been higher. And sloths are weird. They only sleep for, they sleep for about 15 to hour, 18 hours a day. And they're active only for uh, very, very brief periods of time. And although they can walk on the ground and swim very well, they like to live in the high branches. And they only descend once every eight days to poop. That's quite a common fact. And that's when the sloth moths kind of come down and lay their eggs in the poop and the cycle of life continues, of course. They use these long claws that they have, as you can see, to uh, climb and rip through branches and kind of eat that. And they also are able to withstand um, hanging inverted for several periods of time due to the fibrous adhesives which are, uh, keep their organs in place and their lower ribs. And um, as an adult, they are solitary, except when raising young, and males have been observed to fight each other with their claws. Uh, they have a very small home ranges, about 9 hectares is their largest, and it's only half a hectare for their smallest, it depends on the local environment. Within a typical 5 hectare range, they will visit about 40 trees, and they may specialise in one particular species. And um, all of their generalist individual sloths may feed on a relatively narrow type of groups of leaves, just because they want to eat. And they get most of the fluids from their leaves, but they have been observed drinking. In addition to their fur, they obviously listen with the species of moths as well. Uh, ja jaguars and harpy eagles have been one of the few natural predators of the sloths. And the yellow-headed um, caracara has been observed to uh, forage in small invertebrates and the fur of sloths, and also uh, without the sloths being disturbed, so that's pretty cute. And in terms of reproduction, they're a polygamous uh, mating system. Similar to brown toad sloths, uh, studies of brown toad sloths have indicated they commonly mate during January and March, and at least the northern parts of the range, but it may vary because they have a very large range. Gestation lasts for at least seven months, with a single young being born fully fur, full, uh, fully furred with claws, and the young sloths will cling to their mother's underside uh, for about five months or more, and they're fully weaned at just four to five weeks. Uh, so they typically just hang out on their mum for a while. The mammary glands of the females do not produce that much milk compared to most other mammals. Uh, since the infant sloth remains attached to the nipple at all times, it consumes milk as it's generated, and the young begin to eat, uh, begin to eat solid food as early as food four days after being uh, born, and they will lick particles from their mother's mouths and all that and eat those leaves. And for a uh, small animal, they have quite a long lifespan. The estimated lifespan of a brown-throated three-toed sloth is about 30 to 40 years. That's a very, very interesting. Long-lived animal, and they're considered least concerned, so they're quite common. And I'm really excited to see this guy in Planet Zoo. Leafy did a wonderful job, and it fits well on the koala. I just love sloths. They're just so cool. Uh, and it's cool to see them, because I think they've been a highly requested animal for a while. It'd be cool if um, we had a dedicated sloth, and they could just hang out and vibe. They'd be a good exhibit, and I'm not going to lie, but I think these guys came out wonderfully. So, yeah, that's the end of it today. We've thank Leaf and all the other model, uh, modders for doing a wonderful job with all these species. So, yeah, I think this would be a great place to end. So, I um, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. 
always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye.